As I introduce to you our final conversation, which really reiterates the principle of collaboration, I want to just use my latitude as the MC this morning to say this. Margaret Thatcher said, if you want something said correctly, give it to a man. But if you want something done correctly, give it to a woman. And so, yes, I'm being facetious, but I'm just trying to remind you that the conversations we're having about development in whatever shape or form ultimately impacts women as a constituency. We make up more than 50% of the global population. We have the greatest of vulnerabilities. We need the greatest access. But it's really, really encouraging to know that in the field of multilateral development, many women lead, many women are shaping the discourse. And we have used this final conversation to showcase that, that women are front and center at the agenda and in setting the agenda, at the table and in setting the agenda. And so as we have a final conversation on collaboration, we're expanding the definition of collaboration beyond uh, multilateral development institutions and showing you that multilateralism is much wider. It's building a community much wider. And here they are, ably led by Melinda Crane. Thank you so much, Lerato. You have an amazing collection of quotes, I have to say. And I, <laughs> I love being introduced with a Margaret Thatcher quote. So many thanks for that. And hello, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. As we heard earlier today, we are now nearly at the midway point for the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 agenda, uh, that midway point just two months away, and I think we don't need another reminder. We are not where we need to be on the SDGs. The Global Stock Take Report on Climate Action, it will be released in September, but the same is true here. We are way off track. As we have discussed throughout the day, a confluence of crises is putting hundreds of millions of people at risk of hunger, and it has overstretched resources at both the national and the multilateral levels, all of which makes accelerating action on the global goals quite literally a matter of life and death. And that's why this closing conversation today is entitled Policies and Partnerships that Prioritize People and the Planet. And it brings together a absolutely outstanding group of, as you can see, women leaders who are working across silos and sectors to boost development that is socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable, all three at the same time. And yes, it can be done. And in fact, we are going to begin with a round of discussion that doesn't focus on the challenges and the problems, but on actionable solutions, on your uh, contributions, what you have seen in your own work, in your own experiences, in terms of actionable, groundbreaking approaches that can help us to prioritize both people and the planet. So I will introduce our speakers one by one as they contribute quickly a short look at their headlines on that, and then we're going to take a deeper dive, first on action for the planet, and then on action to boost resilience uh, for people. So that's where we're going, that's our roadmap, and it is now a great pleasure uh, to begin on actionable solutions with Dr. Nawal al Hosani. She is seated next to me. She's the permanent representative of the UAE to the International Renewable Energy Agency, Irene and she also serves as Deputy Director General of the Emirates Diplomatic Academy. So over to you, Noelle, to get us started. Thank you. Served. I used to be. I'm currently only the PR to Irina. First, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Your Excellencies, for being in such an amazing uh, forum. May I, may I start with something that is not on the agenda, but I just cannot not address it. Your Excellency, I would beg you 
to maybe pledge for next forum, we don't have a whole men panel ever again. <laughs> because somebody mentioned we are coming maybe in 20 years back to the same conversation and the same panels. And if we're going to have an all men panel discussing the same thing over and over, we are definitely going to be knocking on the same door and we are definitely going to get the same solution. Nothing against men, but it is a global challenge and we are more than 50% of the global population. And we are actually people impacted, or if we are looking at who is impacted by climate change, women are more impacted, and that's statistically a fact. So those who are more impacted should be closest to making the solutions. So if we are to make good solutions, we need to have that to be on the agenda. And, and to your point, we are way off track on many, many of our SDGs and many of our targets. And when it comes to gender, we're definitely not even close to being on track. So back to your question. I, I think the beautiful thing about being the last panel is, you know, if, um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud said a quote in Arabic, which is, I'm going to say another quote in Arabic, which is Musk. So when you end something, you end with like musk. So this is, we are ending with, the, with basically the nicest, let's say, uh, scent in the in the session, uh, but the beautiful thing about it is because we heard from everybody, so we know what worked and what we need to do more to work more. So what what worked is international collaboration. That's very very important. So international collaboration is key. Doubling and tripling renewable energy, and if we look into the latest statistics from from Irina, we need to triple renewable energy, and 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 there is already Irina is working with the UAE on a roadmap to make this happen by 2030. Uh, ensuring that at the heart of the solution, we don't forget anybody, and nobody is left behind. So, women, youth, and the global south. This is extremely extremely important. And the fourth, which is also something that we cannot emphasize enough, and I think we heard few people speak about it. Energy transition is critical, but we are not all starting from the same place. So we definitely need to keep that in mind, because if we are going to have a just energy transition, that has to come with very pragmatic uh, approach that keeps in mind a roadmap for everybody, so nobody is left behind, and we do have a very just and uh, looks into energy security in the same lens as energy access, because we still have millions, I think almost 700 million people still have zero access, and that's the real crisis when it comes to energy security and, and energy transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to come back to that last point in our final round of discussion. The next speaker is uh, the proverbial person who needs no introduction at this forum. Uh, Shaima al Shaibi, as you undoubtedly all know, is Senior Director of Strategic Planning and Economic Services at the OPEC Fund. So over to you, Shaima, for your headlines on actionable solutions. Thank you so much, Melinda, and uh, welcome to all our guests. Thank you all for being here. Um, so, actually, I'd like to um, frame my conversation on the three points that uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen has uh, made. Um, the first is that climate finance is development finance. Um, we totally agree. Um, as an organization that is deeply rooted in the South, uh, the single global MDB that has a South-South mandate we see climate change as the single most cross-cutting theme in all our sectors and all our projects. The need for climate finance is critical, and we fully embrace this through our climate action plan. More on this later. The second point he made uh, is that global public goods needs, need to stem from national platforms. We totally agree. We, have, we work across 125 countries at the OPEC Fund, and not only do we work at the national level, but also at the grassroots level, where our support to MSMEs, $500 million in the past three years alone, has accelerated enterprise and supported youth and women entrepreneurship. And the last point is that he made is that development banks, MDBs, need to be both bigger and better. We totally agree. As an institution that has built its business model on the fact that partnerships 
um, resonate and support impact and amplify it, we have partnered with most MDBs, philanthropies, NGOs, mostly everybody who is in this hall today, and this has really thrusted us forward. We are now looking into launching creative and inventive partnerships. Last year, we've uh, launched the Climate Finance and Energy Innovation Hub. More on that later. But you see, we're totally focused on policies and partnerships that promote people and planet. Back to you, Melinda. Thank you so much, uh, Shaima. Wonderful. Let me go now to Kate Robertson. She's co-founder of the initiative One Young World, which brings together young leaders from across the planet, both as a network and as a summit. And its thousands of One Young World ambassadors have impacted the lives of millions of people. Over to you, Kate. Thanks, Steph. Um, Director General, thank you so much. Tarek and Nadia, thank you so much. One Young World has had a partnership with the OPEC Fund for International Development from when we started until about, I think it was 2018, just before the pandemic, whereby they would help us to find young leaders across the developing world. Why young leaders? And I was talking to Dima earlier and saying, we're not working at One Young World with youth. We're working with young leaders. And I felt there was so much today because so many of the people that were on this stage were leaders themselves, genuinely leaders, clearly leaders of impact. It's no good any single organization, certainly not one as small as ours, trying to do this alone. The collaboration required is absolutely serious. But here's the thing. Young people around the world today in the age group that we are working with at One Young World, which is 18 to 30, are the most informed, most educated, most connected generation in human history. They just are. That's just a fact. Old people like me may not like it, but it's a fact. They are the masters of the world that we are going to be living in, and certainly our children are living in that. So leadership from them means their generation can't, like mine, wait for Nelson Mandela to come out of prison after 23 years, or Malala Yousafzai to get herself shot in the head for a leader to emerge. So caring for those leaders is what we're about. It's intergenerational, and they're completely with you, completely with you. Climate mitigation of carbon emissions is number, number one focus, but they say to us as an organization, please measure everything because the world doesn't care about us as young people. We go and we sit at, not this institution, I'm glad to say, we sit at certain things where they put us on panels, young people are at the table, no one's listening to us, so it doesn't matter. So to be heard, please measure what we do. So we measure only 50 projects a year where we have thousands of projects. But the 50 that we measure in the period since the pandemic have mitigated over a million tons of carbon. And we would measure all the projects and have millions in that number. But that's what we're working on. These people need every single one of you in this room. Real investment in the mitigation and adaptation projects they're engaged in. And many of them are not small. They're not little things where you can say, hey, have a thousand bucks and it's all going to be okay. We were joined in our efforts for eight years by the late, great Kofi Annan for exactly the reasons we talked about today. I, with that brilliant professor who was on earlier from Colombia, I was with you at COP 2015 when we did Mr. Annan's campaign for COP. What a depressing time that was. I keep telling myself that with the support of the fund and everybody else here, maybe it's not as bad as 2015. I think it's worse, but I just keep telling myself it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. And finally, over to uh, Jan Beagle, who is Director General of the International Development Law Organization. And she has had a 40-year career in multilateral diplomacy that has included leading positions at UNAIDS, UNDP, and a special advisor to the United Nations Sec Secretary General. So please, your headlines. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, Director General, uh, for inviting us to be here. We're an intergovernmental organization, and we're devoted to promoting the rule of law, but for a purpose, to advance peace and sustainable development. And we're particularly focused on people-centered justice, and we're very proud uh, that OFIT is, is a member party of IDLO. Uh, 
I wanted just to focus on three areas that we think is, uh, are very essential for actionable results. And they really build on what the other speakers have said. First, we have to empower the vulnerable people. And in the case of climate, we must empower uh, the women, the indigenous people, the rural communities, the youth, the displaced uh, people, the climate migrants, if you like. We need to empower them to know their rights, and we also need to have them participating in decision-making. Decision-making has to be uh, rooted in local realities, and when we support governments um, to create new policies or regulations, we always insist on that multi-stakeholder consultation to, to get there. Secondly, we've got to strengthen laws and capacity uh, to promote more client resilient, uh, climate resilient uh, development. And there, we've got to build institutions that can guarantee access for people. And often these are not formal institutions. Often these are informal, customary, uh, and informal justice institutions where the majority of people in the world are getting their justice. And in fact, in many cases, they're faster and more locally relevant than the formal systems, but often they're also traditional and patriarchal and maybe discriminating against women, youth, and others. We've got to make sure that they work well in accordance with uh, international standards. And finally, we've got to ensure that the governance mechanisms that we have, the policy frameworks, the legal frameworks, are uh, those that engender trust. So we've got to look at corruption, illegal, uh, illicit uh, financial flows. We've got to ensure that people feel confidence in their institutions, and I think this is something that we've seen, particularly over this COVID period, that trust in institutions has really diminished, and we have to work to build that back. Thank you very much for that, uh, for putting a lot of content and meaning into the term rule of law, which we so often use, but which sometimes sounds uh, a little sterile. So many thanks for that. Let us now move on to policies and partnerships for climate and environment, and then we'll come back to resilience uh, at the close. So, Noelle, you talked about the need to dramatically scale up action on renewables. Certainly that is a main focus also of Irina's new work. World Energy Transition Outlook. And tell us a little bit about what you see as the most promising policies for doing that. What, do we, what, what can we do to boost this at the kind of scale that, that you're talking about? Well, let me start by thanking Your Excellency and uh, OPEC Fund for partnering with Irina uh, on the ETAF, which is Energy Transition Accelerator uh, Finance Platform. And that's a very important platform because it aims to, uh, by 2030, hopefully reach uh, uh, 50, uh, sorry, 5 giga of renewables. That's going to be basically targeting um, uh, least developed countries and uh, SIDS. And this, this contribution is extremely important because it shows that Renewables now, and we heard it throughout the, the speeches, makes commercial sense. Because it is important for development, but also one of the cheapest sources of energy. And we've seen, like the, in, in the UAE alone, we have three of the largest, cheapest uh, solar power plant in the world. So to, for us to reach the scale that we need, we need international cooperation, we need mobili mobilizing fund, but we need uh, uh, projects that are uh, attractive to uh, in, uh, uh, global investments. And, and we see that once you have those together and you have a trusted partner, because trust is very important, like IRENA and like OPEC Fund and others, then, you know, magic happens. Because once you mobilize capital, and which is also extremely important, and I don't think we've heard enough about it today, the political will and the political leadership to make this happen, then we will see that mobilizing very quickly. And, and, and with IRENA, the work that we do is we, you know, educating and ensuring that, you know, we, we are sharing best practice with different member states countries. We are connecting them with investment opportunities and investment platforms and providing uh, the enabling environment for, for those investments. So you, you mentioned that we need to have great examples. ETAF is one of the important examples. Today, ETAF is, 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 is more than a billion dollars with the generous contribution of uh, OPEC Fund now. And uh, we have Empowering Lives and Livelihood, which is another initiative that's going to reach one billion to um, uh, 
as, as the name of the initiative is to empower lives and livelihoods through uh, climate uh, solutions that's focusing on health and uh, agri-food and agriculture and many, many other examples that, you know, a partnership between the UAE and IRENA and other member states and IRENA that is making, uh, that is happening in, in many countries using innovative technology solutions such as uh, technologies that are very much climatic, um, environmentally sensitive to, to certain regions, for example, the folding wind, wind turbines, and using innovative solutions, uh, finance, financial solutions, and uh, ensuring that we are mobilizing enough political will to make those projects uh, happen on a large scale. Thank you very much. And I'll go straight over uh, to Nawal, if I may, to also talk, uh, to, uh, sorry, to uh, uh, Shaima, to also talk about, um, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> to also talk about policies that you think are key for uh, doing, uh, for prioritizing action on climate. And you mentioned the climate impact uh, uh, facility in particular. So maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. So thank you. Um, yes, so, you know, our climate finance, uh, which, as I said, is the single most important cross-cutting theme of all, is determined by our climate action plan. And let me just share with you briefly what that is. The climate action plan commits us to increasing our climate financing to 40% of all our operations by 2030. Um, we're committed to um, support policy development, um, innovative, transformative pipeline of lower carbon and green recovery projects that all have built-in innovations to attract private capital. And we commit $5 billion from now until 2030. Last year, in uh, COP27, we also convened the Arab Coordination Group, um, heads of institutions, and together we announced a, clim a joint climate action of $24 billion. Um, this governs all our institutions' support for climate work. So let me go back to policy, how we support policy as the OPEC fund. In the past three years alone, we uh, approved policy and program loans, totaling $1.2 billion, to support enabling climate policies in partner countries. Policies that drive both inclusive growth as well as energy transition, and therefore a win-win for development and climate outcomes. Two examples of these uh, which do exactly that are um, Colombia's Climate Action and Energy Transition Program, uh, where we supported uh, this for $150 million, as well as support to the economic resilience and green recovery in Botswana, for example. Many more examples uh, exist. We're also intensifying our efforts to deliver our climate fi financing through transformational projects that actually do help flatten the emission curve. Uh, we are contributing to the acceleration of en energy transition, and as uh, Dr. Noel has mentioned, through partnerships with the likes of IRENA. And here really, uh, to Dr. Nawal, uh, I'd really like to thank uh, the UAE's leadership role. Uh, IRENA is not only putting in bulk of finance that is scalable, but it's also been tackling complex, dynamic problems in a pointed, well-informed, and attentive manner. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nawal, for your support. Um, going forward, we also intend to play a, cat a catalytic role in bi biodiversity uh, conservation. Uh, we're currently exploring collaboration with the Asian Development Bank, one of our greatest partners, uh, to set up uh, the first nature-focused uh, financing hubs for the Asia-Pacific region. We're also discussing that with the Arab Coordination Group, and hopefully we will, this will come to fruition uh, sometime soon. Um, so as you can see, again, um, policies and partnerships that really do conserve planet. Thank you. 
And I think your emphasis on capacity building in the policy area is very, very interesting because, of course, that's part of political will, isn't it? Uh, for, for leaders to exercise political will, they absolutely do need to have the tools of the trade. And, uh, and I think that emphasis is key uh, in what you're doing. So thank you very much for that. And let me go over to Kate uh, to talk again about, uh, about young people in this context also of action for the planet. Because because, of course, they are the important stakeholders in the future health of the planet. So what policies and practices are proving really effective at empowering them to be part of setting these transformative policy solutions going forward? How do you bring them in as leaders? Well, at the moment, it's a desert, isn't it, really? I mean, you listen to what you were saying about the UAE, which is amazing. And there are clearly governments in the room who are doing things that are amazing. You know, and I know, in the industrialized West, particularly in the democracies, God help me, I didn't think I would ever say this, leadership is weak and pathetic when it comes to setting policies regarding this crisis. That is just a fact. And if any of us think that young people don't see that, we're fools. They see it, and they actually, as that young professor was saying, they really can't believe it. So what policies are they looking for? They are looking for the policies that everybody here today has actually set up. Everybody that was on the stage today set up a target and said it should be like that. So all of this stuff about the enabling, I mean, right from the beginning where they were saying, I think with Stephanie's session, the G7 regulatory framework isn't there to enable you to do all the things that you need to do. So we're sitting here, we're applauding certain countries, UAE being one of them, where the policies are there. But here we're sitting with the law. Where are the laws that enables us to do what we need to do about climate change? Really straightforward. That has to come from governments. It comes from leadership in governments, and there's not a lot of it about. Thank you very much. And I think, Jan, uh, I, I'd like to ask you to build on that. Uh, Noel and I were having a conversation earlier, a kind of a nerdy SDG type conversation about which SDGs we like best. Well, number 16 yes. is definitely uh, probably my favorite, maybe because I'm a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, we're getting different votes on the panel, but, but let's talk about the rule of law and the governance goal in terms of how we can use it to truly enhance accountable climate action. You know, Kate was talking earlier about measuring things. Well, measuring is the beginning, but it's certainly not the end of accountability and compliance. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. I think that we would agree SDG 16 is not only important in its own right, peaceful, just, and resilient societies, but it's an enabler, hopefully, for all of the other SDGs. And what we would say is that you've got to look at policies if they're going to be effective through a people-centered lens and through a human rights lens. You've got, as I said earlier, to involve the people concerned. It only works if those who are affected are part of the decision making. i just give one quick example. For, ex for example, we have supported uh, the government of Kenya, um, which enacted in 2016 um, the first uh, framework climate change uh, law in Africa, and that was to give effect to a provision in the Constitution from some years before on the right to a clean environment. But what did that mean? And in order to make it actually happen, there was a very broad consultations to ensure that the type of law that was put in place was fair and inclusive. We've also got to look at ways to handle climate-related disputes uh, before they escalate into mass movements of people or conflict or loss of livelihoods and, and distrust, again, more distrust between um, people and, and central institutions. And there we've got, again, to look at different types of um, institutions and particularly we're looking a lot at an alternative dispute resolution um, in, in helping many um, different um, countries at different levels of development and with different legal systems to bring in alternative dispute resolution uh, centers and also to empower indigenous people because they also need to know their rights and to be participating uh, in uh, decisions at making. And the last thing I would say is that I do uh, believe, as many have said today, that South-South cooperation is key. There are many excellent examples in the South that we can share, and that's one of the things that we are trying uh, to do at IDLO, to find good examples 
And of course, local context is always important, but how can we use those examples from the South um, to um, help others move forward? Thank you very much. And um, I want to switch now to a focus on resilience and people, but maybe I'm going to do it with a bridge that essentially you just uh, helped me to build. Not too long ago, I was moderating at a conference that was about early warning systems for climate stress and what they could tell us about likely conflict and or migration. And we had scientists from all over the world uh, present there at this conference, and the organizers thought that they were going to hear a lot about indicators, rainfall, drought, uh, and so on, and that that would perhaps help them to come up with better algorithms. But scientist after scientist from Latin America, from Africa, really from, from all around the world said, you know what is the most important indicator that we see? It's not the amount of rain that falls, it's who it falls on. How resilient is this society? How inclusive is it? We look at where are the women and children in this society, and that's how we know what is likely to happen if they face climate stress, because the more inclusive, the better they can cope. That's a definition of resilience. So I'd like to ask all of you in this closing round to talk about what you see as key to boosting inclusion, gender, young people, marginalized groups, what you think is key, and how we all can collaborate to work together toward that end for people. So please, Noah. It's definitely not only IKEA. I think it's the only way for us to move forward. And that's why, if I may, if I will be, speak about one example, I will speak about the COP28. So just quickly, I'll just give you some statistics. So for COP28, we have uh, the uh, three members of the, of the presidency, two of them are women. So we have Dr. Sultan, supported by Her Excellency Shamman and Her Excellency Rezan. Looking at the closer, we have for the first time ever youth climate champion, and we can, that shows how much we are focusing on youth engagement, the climate talks. Until today, we have the, the COP28 team has more women than men. So 50% more women, 50% plus women in the team. We have more than 40 nationalities with over 60% representing G77 countries and the age is, the median age is 36. So what we see and why, and why those statistics are important to flag is but we see it reflects the diversity of today's population and and hence the solutions that we need to, to identify and how we need to have a cross-cutting technologies and solution to address the biggest challenge we have. So if I may, I'm just, I'll use that to speak about COP28. Thank you, and those are some pretty impressive statistics you shared with us. Shaima. Thank you. So, you know, again, because our mandate is South-South, we are so deeply rooted in, uh, our, with our partner countries. Our member countries suffer exactly the same problems. And we see the topic of climate change as it really is, as the global threat that discriminates against the weakest and most vulnerable. And our mission is to help protect them and empower them. To do so, we must scale the delivery of sustainable finance to women and youth. It is as simple as that. We must create women and youth-based wealth. The OPEC Fund has been working very closely and its work has been always people-centered, focusing on the Global South's greatest asset, which is really our, our human capital. In, ad in addition to the MSME support, uh, that I've mentioned earlier, we are currently working on an initiative that ultimately aims to unlock sustainable financing for the most vulnerable with a particular focus on women and youth. Last year, we uh, launched at our uh, development, inaugural development forum, our Climate Finance and Energy Innovation Hub. This is a, a partnership that is with Sustainable Energy for All and United Nations Capital Development Fund which is really mapping out key opportunities, pursuing them through policy support, capacity building, project bankability, and de-risking tools, and using all these as levers to accelerate private capital flow, enterprises that support women and youth. This year, 
just yesterday, we've also signed a partnership agreement with the World Food Programme. We intend to replicate the same system, but not for energy transition, for what Dr. Jai Shroff today said, for the agriculture sector transition, with huge focus on small uh, holder farmers that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, with a special focus on women through capacity building to help reduce the, the gender productivity gap. More and more, we're working with our partners, a lot of them again in this room, in order to be able to deliver policies that really do support the most vulnerable. Um, going forward to COP28, we're actually uh, in discussions to explore new partnerships to create brand new financial ecosystems that understand, value, promote, and provide financial platforms that can nurture the business ventures of youth and women at scale. So we know that one thing is clear for us is that we're all in this together and through excellent partnerships like we have in this room and elsewhere, we can deliver partnerships and policies that really do support the people. Thank you. Thank you very much and I think, yeah. I think, I think there's such an optimistic message in that because so often we focus on particularly the energy transition but also the, the climate challenge as um, undermining jobs. Uh, we focus on the old industry picture and we forget about all those jobs that can be created for those who so much need them uh, for the large youth populations in the global south, but of course everywhere. And that's, uh, you know, you made it very clear uh, that that promise is there. We just have to figure out how to build it. Uh, so thanks very much. Kate. Um, just isn't that fantastic, the work that the OPEC Fund is doing? Really, it's, it's great. What I would just say, and again, not to end on a negative note, but there's so much real power in this room, is just to focus on this. This is all incredible and fantastic work, and it does build resilience, and it's building it multilaterally, which for me is, is, is key. Nothing changes the fact that for all the work that has gone on by all of us for the last how many years, carbon emissions are rising. They are rising, okay? Policy and action by the United States and China is not there. Those two alone hold the key. This is a fact. So we've got fantastic efforts on South-South, amazing efforts. Nothing changes the fact that those two giants are causing everything. So all of us in every single policy forum need to bang this drum. What are they and the G20 everyone in the G20, that's where the emissions are, that is the power, this will have to be dealt with, otherwise the efforts cannot be enough. Thank you. Jan. Well, of course, you know I'm going to say that uh, well-designed laws and policies obviously are essential for resilient societies, but I believe it's actually true. And I think what, what we have found, uh, three or four uh, important elements when you are uh, developing those policies, and they're very relevant uh, for um, addressing climate change and achieving what we would call climate justice. One of them is to look at the root causes, because the root causes of almost all the crises that we are facing uh, in the international community are coming down to inequalities, uh, discrimination, exclusion. So that's really important. The second, as has been said, is to focus on the vulnerable groups and to remember that people often have multiple intersecting vulnerabilities in one person. You can be a woman, you can be poor, you can be displaced, you can be indigenous, you can be disabled, uh, you can be young. All of those in, in one person, we've got to focus um, on those. And I would say particularly we must focus, as has been said, on women and youth. And we've sincerely got to do something about gender-based violence. It is holding back progress in so many societies, and that is an area uh, that we are working on. Uh, Multi-stakeholder partnerships, absolutely essential. Um, I think uh, arenas like this are absolutely um, 
so positive. Uh, we need to have not only governments, and we need to have civil society, we need to have the private sector, uh, we need to have regional organizations, we need to have parliamentarians, but I would also say we need to have judiciaries, we need academia, and we need the media. We need the media in a yeah. positive uh, way. Uh, finally, I would say investment, and of course this comes to political will. You know that it, whether you're talking on the national level or the international level, uh, it's not easy to get investment in the rule of law. Um, it's not something which is, which is usually high on the agenda. I think it's very important to understand how essential it is uh, as a base to build more resilient societies, to um, address conflict, to address climate change. Uh, it's absolutely essential that we build those resilient societies. And so I would ask those of you who have the possibility to think about investing in the rule of law. A relatively small investment can, I think, pay very large dividends. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think if there's one thing that can be said uh, this, about this confluence of crises on the upside, it is that it has focused attention on resilience as few times beforehand. So I think positive action can hopefully proceed from the fact that we at least now look at resilience uh, much more closely than we did before. Dear women leaders on this panel. Many, many thanks for sharing your insights and your perspectives and for helping us to end uh, this closing conversation on, I think, a very inspiring note. There is obviously a huge amount of work to be done, but you've given us a sense, I think, uh, of, of where we need to be going and of, of hope. So thank you very much for that. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Back to you, Lerato. And so as we really reflect on what's been a wonderful day of insightful, thought-provoking conversation, allow me to just give my own personal reflections. And they're very personal, these reflections. So at the very first edition of the uh, Development Forum hosted by the OPEC Fund, I was also the host of that forum, and I mentioned then that um, I am originally South African. Yes, coming from the BBC and other media, but I'm a South African-born girl. To be more specific, I'm a Soweto-born girl. <laughs> and many of you will know the history of South Africa with its inequalities, with its polarities, with its conflicts. And when South Africa was in its darkest era, it was the countries of the South that kept banging the drum on behalf of the South African people so that the world does not forget. It was the countries of the global socialist solidarity movement it was countries of the non-aligned movement. And it was that coalition called the G77 within the United Nations that said, do not forget the people of South Africa. And in 1994, when Nelson Mandela led us to democracy, and we were a new country birthing in a metamorphosis, it was once again countries of the South that said to South Africa, what do you need as a helping hand? And the first tranche of investments, particularly in areas such as schools and hospitals, came from those international networks within the South. I'm telling you this because South-South cooperation leads to tangible outcomes. I stand here as a South African telling you this. They are relationships born of fraternity and camaraderie. And countries of the developing world that will know what poverty looks like. Not imagine it, no, not romanticize it. Know what it looks like and know what it takes to create tangible solutions. And so a forum such as this, enhancing the relationship between the South, is really designed to say, from the prism of our lens, our reality, 
How do we tailor solutions that really and truly will go to the heart of the problem? So we take international norms and standards that converge and we localize them to the reality of what it is like to be born and bred in a country of the developing markets. And then to look at countries of the South that have actually made a tangible difference, actually stimulated and catalyzed change and say, how can I emulate this country? How can I emulate a Saudi Arabia, a, a UAE, an Egypt or an India? And so this is a very important platform, not only because it's bringing together lead actors in a complex field known as multilateral development, but it brings together that category of leaders from the South who know realistically what it is like to be born and bred in a country of the South. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard a lot of things about reform of um, uh, financial systems, business models, development models, assessments of risks, bringing in global standards such as the UN SDGs. But what was said unequivocally is that the time has come to put people front and center of the development agenda. And those people are me, the children of the South. And when you go back home, remember me, I'm a child of the South.